this video I'm talking you through the answers to the uh, Adexcel IGCSE higher paper from the 15th of January 2020. Question one. Well here we're just following the index laws. So when you're dividing, you subtract the powers. 9 take away 2 is 7. So x to the power of 7. And part b, start off with the numerator. When we're multiplying, we add the powers. 8 of 4 is 12. Then we're dividing 7 to the power of 12 divided by 7 to the power of 3. When we're dividing, we subtract the powers. 12 take away 3 is 9. So that's 7 to the power of 9. Question 2. Now you've got to be very careful with these. Um, there are 100 centimetres in a metre, but don't just times it by 100. This is going from centimetres cubed to metres cubed. This is three-dimensional. So you've got to multiply the 32.4 to by 100 to the power of 3. Had it been metres squared into centimetres squared, you'd have multiplied by 100 to the power of 2. Question 3. So start off with the left-hand side and convert the um, mixed numbers into improper fractions. So make sure you're comfortable with converting 4 and 2 thirds into 14 over 3 and 3 and 4 fifths into 19 over 5. Uh, if you can't remember how to do that, the shortcut is keep the denominators the same, so thirds and fifths, and then go 4 threes are 12, 12 and 2 is 14, or 3 fives are 15, 15 and 4 is 19. Now, once you've got them as uh, top-heavy fractions, improper fractions, you need a common denominator. So the easiest one to have here is 15, 3 fives of 15. So 15 as your denominator. Now, how did I convert from a denominator of 3 to a de denominator of 15? I've times by 5. So to, keep, so to keep the fraction equivalent, you've also got to multiply the numerator by 5. 14 times 5 is 70. Then repeat for the 19 over 5. 5 times 3 is 15, so 19 times 3 is 57. Now you've got the common denominator, you can add the numerators. 70 add 57 is 127. And then convert from top-heavy fraction back to mixed numbers. So 8 lots of 15 is 120. So the 8 lots, 8 holes is used up 120, leaving us with 7 fifteenths, which is what we had to show. Question four. So here we're going to be constructing and solving an equation. Now the angles in a triangle add up to 180. So 30 plus 4x plus 10 plus x plus 20 has to equal 180. And that's my first line of workings. Now simplify the left-hand side. 4x plus x is 5x. 30 add 10 add 20 is 60. Then take away 60 from both sides. Divide by 5 we get x being 24. Question 5. Now, bisecting an angle is just halving the angle. So we're using a ruler and compass to halve the angle BAC. So say that angle was 40 degrees. We're trying to draw in the purple line at 20 degrees. But we don't use a protractor for this. We're trying to use a ruler and compass, which is more accurate. So step 1 is my line here in blue. So get your compass, um, put the point here at A, then draw a small little arc here. And the purpose of this is just to establish these two X marks, the spots here, which it doesn't matter what distance it is, but they're the same distance from A. So that's step one. Step two, perhaps just slightly increase the, the length of the radii on the compass. Okay, And you're now going to put the point here to start with and draw an arc which I've done in red, and then go and put the, the, uh, the point here. You're not changing the size on the compass, and draw a second arc here. So my blue line is my first set of workings, my first workings. These two red um, lines, curves, are my second bit of workings. Now where these two red lines have crossed, that's where we need to do a straight line through. So you're using your ruler just as a straight edge. You're not measuring with it. So get your ruler and line it up going through A, line it up going through where the two red uh, arcs cross, and then just draw a straight line through that. And that's your final answer. That purple line is your final answer. That's 
that's halving the angle BAC. But make sure you leave all your construction lines in, that they're your workings. Question six. Now we're told that the probability that the bead will be green is twice the probability that the bead will be red. So take the smaller probability at red and just call that X. So the green one, which is twice as likely to happen, we can call 2x. Now we know our probabilities are always going to add up to a whole, add up to 1. So x plus 0.24 plus 2x plus 0.31 must equal 1. So again, like a bit earlier on, we just constructed an equation that we're going to have to solve. So gather up the left-hand side, x plus 2x is 3x. 0.24 add 0.31 is 0.55. Take away 0.55 from both sides, we get 3x equaling 0.45. Divide by 3, we get x being 0.15. So the probability of a red with a single um, pick is 0.15. Now, Sophia repeats this 180 times. So how many reds would you expect to get? What would be your estimate? So you go and take the probability of a single red, 0.15, multiply it by 180 and this gives us 27. Question 7a. So this is an inequality but just follow the usual process you would do if it had an equal sign in there. It's just, just your normal algebraic processing manipulation. So how do you undo an adding of 7? We take away 7 from both sides. So 2x is greater than minus 3. How do we undo times in by 2? We divide by 2, so x is greater than minus 3 over 2, or x is greater than minus 1.5. Now for part b, you could use the quadratic formula, but it's, I think it's easier when it does factorise to actually factorise. So we're going to create a pair of brackets, and because we've got an x squared, the first term in each bracket is going to be x times x, so both, they're both x's. And then we need to work out these magic numbers. Now, how have we worked these out? Well, we're looking for two numbers, which when we multiply them together, give us minus 40, the number on the end. So multiplied equals minus 40. But at the same time, these two magic numbers have to add to be the coefficient of x. So they have to add to be the minus 3. So which two numbers both multiply to be minus 40, but add to be minus 3, and that's 5 and minus 8. 5 times minus 8 is minus 40, and 5 take away 8 is minus 3. So those are our magic numbers. So we've now factorised it successfully, and we've now got to find the roots, find the solutions. Now this is the easy bit. We've got two brackets here being multiplied together. Now if we want to end up with 0, we need either of the brackets to be 0. So which value of x would make this first bracket 0? Well, that's x being minus 5. Okay, when x is minus 5, this first bracket is 0. 0 times whatever is 0. Now, our second solution comes from what value of x makes the second bracket 0? Well, that's going to be x being 8, 8 minus 8 being 0. Because then again, the second bracket will be 0, and 0 times whatever's in the first bracket will be 0. So our two solutions are x equals minus 5, and x equals 8. Question 8, part A. So we've got to find out if Bridget is correct. So let's start off with this bit in purple, working out the percentage increase from 2016 to 2017. Now, to work out a percentage increase, it's the change divided by the original amount times 100. So going from 2016 to 2017, it's a 45 increase. 545 minus 500, divide that by the original amount 500 and times this by 100% and that gives you 9%. So the percentage increase from 2016 to 2017 is 9%. Now going from 17 to 18, the increase is 592 take away 545 and then divide this by the original amount 545 times this by 100 and we get 8.62%. So Bridget is not correct because the 9% is greater than the 8.62%. 8B. Now there's a 15% discount, so that's reducing it by 15%. So the multiplier is going to be 100% take away 15%, which is 85%. 
85 over 100, 85% is 0.85. So if we were going from the original amount to the final amount, we would multiply by 0.85. But here we're going from the final amount back to the original amount, so we have to divide by the 0.85. 952 divided by 0 0.85 is 1120. So what discount did Henry get? Well, he would have paid 1120 without the discount, but he actually paid 952. So take the 952 from the 1120, and Henry got a 168 euro discount. Question nine. Well, there's really two ways to approach this. So I've done it both ways. I've done it the blue way, and I've done it the... Um, purple way. So let's just do the blue way first of all and just use the fact that density equals mass over volume. Rearrange this to make mass the subject, so times both sides by V. So M equals D times V. D is 19.3, V is 150. Times them together you get 2895 grams. Alternatively, you can just really go back to first principles about what density means. It's the actual mass per centimetres cubed. So it's 19.3 grams for every centimetres cubed. But we've got 150 centimetres cubed, so by proportion, we're having to times by 150. 19.3 times 150 is still 2895 grams. So either method, whichever one you prefer. So we're changing a speed which is 50 metres per second. So just again, just really think about it proportionally. So 50 uh, metres uh, in one second. So how far are you going to be able to travel in 60 seconds, which is one minute? Well, obviously 60 times as far. So 50 times 60 is 3,000 metres. So that's how far you would go in one minute, in metres. Now what about in an hour? Well, an hour is 60 minutes. So times this by 60 again, and it will show us that it's this number of metres you could go in one hour. So 180,000 metres in one hour. But we want to know it in kilometres. Now there are 1,000 kilometres, sorry, 1,000 metres in a kilometre. So we're going to divide the 180,000 by 1,000, giving us 180 kilometres travelled in one hour. So the speed is 180 kilometres per hour. So it's all about appreciating that a speed is just the distance you travel in an hour. Question 11, we're being asked to work out the perimeter of this shape. So that's just running around this shape. So that's going to be 15 plus 17, whatever the distance is running around the outside of this semicircle. So in order to better work out the, this length here, this curve length, we're going to need to know the diameter of the semicircle, okay, the, 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 that length there, AC. And to do that, I'm going to use Pythagoras on the right angle triangle ACD. Okay, right angle triangle Pythagoras because we know two sides and we're trying to work out the third side. Now because we're trying to work out one of the two shorter sides we're going to use a taking away Pythagoras. We don't want the answer to be bigger than 17. So AC squared equals 17 squared take away 15 squared which equals 64. So that's what AC squared is. So AC is the square root of 64 which is 8. So I've worked out that AC is 8. Now, if I was working out the circumference of a whole circle, it would be pi times the, the diameter. Okay, C equals pi times D. But I just want half the length around a circle, so it's the length around the curved bit of a semicircle. So it's going to be half times pi times the diameter. So that's half times pi times 8, AC being 8. And I'm just going to leave that in terms of pi. It's quicker to write down and it's exact. So the length of the arc ABC is 4 pi. So the length all the way around, the perimeter is the 17 plus the 15 plus the 4 pi. Add those together, I get 44.566 dot dot dot. So to three significant figures, that's 44.6 centimetres. Question 12. Well, we've just got to make these comparable. So we either need to know the litres for both um, in krona or in dollars, and I've decided to do it in dollars. Now, as I go from dollars, um, a krona to dollars, you can see the numbers getting smaller. Okay, 6.57 to 1. So I'm going to have to be dividing by 6.57. 
So if I take my 2.5 million kroner and I divide by 6.57, this is the equivalent of $380,517, roughly. So comparing my Dane oil and my Arctic oil, I've got for the Dane oil, I've got this number of litres costing this number of dollars. And for the Arctic oil, nothing's changed. Is this number of litres costing this number of dollars? So I want to know that the how much each litre is going to cost. Okay, each litre. So how how how, how no, actually start to say that again. I want to work out how many litres I am going to get for each dollar. So I'm going to do litres divided by dollars to let me know how many litres I can buy with one dollar. So. 4.2 times 10 to the 5 divided by 380,517 gives me 1.10376. And Arctic oil, 8.6 times 10 to the 5 divided by this gives me 1.11688. Now, it's better value for money the more oil I can get for each dollar. So the Arctic oil is better value for money. Question 13. Well, the first thing I notice is that AOD is a diameter of the circle. It's going through the centre. So therefore, angle ACD is a right angle because the angle in a semicircle is 90 degrees. So that's 90 degrees. Secondly, I can see that I'm bouncing off the circumference twice from C and D. So C to B to D is 28. So also C to A to D will also be 28. And the circle theory there is the angles at the circumference are the same. They're equal, but you do have to add in the same segment. So it only works if you're bouncing off in this direction, not if you were going into this tiny little segment here. So angles, uh, uh, angles at the circumference in the same segment are equal. Now, once we know that, we can just focus on the triangle um, A to C to D. Because that's 90 and that's 28, uh, then so X plus 32 will be the difference when you take it away from 180. So basically, this angle that we've been required to work out, B, D, C, B to D to C, is going to be 180, take away 90, take away 28, take away 32, which is 30 degrees. So the third fact that we've used is that angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees. So make sure you've, you give a reason for each stage of your working. You must include this narrative three times, or three bits. Question 14. Well, we're told that 13 of the 20 glasses are large. So the probability of a large is 13 out of 20, and small is 7 out of 20. Now, if you're taking two glasses at random, you're effectively taking one glass, popping it down, and then going back to the cupboard and taking a second glass, because you can't take the same glass out twice. So just make sure with your second picks over here, you've made the denomina denominator 19, because there's only 19 glasses left after you've picked one out here. So assuming you picked a large glass to start with, that's one less as you do your second pick, hence why this has gone from 13 to 12, 12 out of 90. Now, given you picked a large glass with your first pick, you haven't taken any of the small glasses, so there's still seven small glasses as you take your second pick, hence seven out of 19. And just double check each time, this V here should always add up to a whole. 12 over 19 and seven over 19 is a whole. Now, assuming you picked a small glass, first of all, down here, what's the chances with your second pick of getting a large glass? Well, you haven't taken a large glass yet. So there's still 13 of them, so 13 out of 19. And then a small glass, given you picked a small glass with your first pick, well, if you've taken a small glass already, there's only going to be six left in the cupboard, so that would be six out of 19. Now, work out the probability that Roberto takes two small glasses. Well, that's going down here and then down here. It's that journey there. So 7 over 20 and 6 out of 19. Now, because it's a small glass and then another small glass, whenever it's an and, you multiply. So 7 over 20 times 6 over 19. Top times top, bottom times bottom is 42 over 380. 
You didn't need to simplify it, but you could do by halving both of them, giving you 21 over 190. Question 15, you really just need to have learnt what these types of glass, uh, graphs all look like. So uh, a reciprocal graph of 1 over x would look like this. Uh, whereas a minus 1 over x reciprocal graph just sort of flips it over, so it would look this shape. Now, when it becomes onto the, your x squared, you're, you're not going to get any negative values, because whenever you square, it becomes positive. So a 1 over x squared looks like that, as compared to the 1 over x looking like that. Because whenever you square, whether you're squaring a positive x value or a minus x value, you're always going to get a positive y value. And then a cubic graph, that's the standard cubic graph when you've got a positive x cubed, and then that just reflects over when you've got a negative x cubed. So on that basis, y equals 2 over x squared is going to be something looking like this, so that's graph C. Minus a half x cubed is going to be something looking like this, so that would be B. And minus 5 over x is going to be something looking like this, which will be E. Question 16. So we're going to make x the subject. So we've got to go from y equaling something to x equaling something. So the first thing we need to undo is this square root. You can't start attacking inside here when all of that's going to be square rooted at the end. So your first step is to square both sides. Now, we want to move away from having a fraction. So how do we undo dividing by x minus 4? We multiply by x minus 4 which I've done here, keep it in a bracket because the y squares can have to be multiplied by both of these terms. So my third line, I've just expanded the bracket, y squared times x is xy squared, and y squared times minus 4 is minus 4y squared. Now, the next line, I've got to get all my terms which have x in them on one side, and all the terms that do not have x in them on the other side. So I'm going to choose to take anything with x's to the left, anything without x is to the right. So this one's got to go. How do I undo minus 4y squared? I add 4y squared. Then this x needs to be on the left-hand side, so I'm taking away x from both sides. So just make sure you understand that line. I've just made sure all my terms which have got x's in are on the left, and all the terms that do not have x's in them are on the right. Now, once I've done that, this is the clever bit. I can then factorize the left-hand side which gives me x bracket y squared minus 1. And now for the first time, I've just got x being mentioned once. Every line beforehand is, 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 in, is, in the, uh, is, in, is twice. There and there, there and there, there and there, there and there, there and there. So finally, we've isolated x. And then one final step, just to have x on its own, how do we go from x times a bracket? We have to undo that bracket. So we're dividing both sides by y squared minus 1. Now, as it's the denominator here, it's clear that the whole thing's been divided by it. We no longer need the brackets. So, final answer. x equals 4y squared plus 1 over y squared minus 1. Question 17. Now, any square number we get by squaring something. So, let's just let n squared be any square number. But then the next square number is going to be n plus 1 or squared. So let's just think about that in number terms. Let's say we've got 9, which is 3 squared. The next square number is going to be 16, which is 4 squared. So we've taken the 3 and we've added 1 and we've squared it. So just this is the key line. Just make sure you're comfortable with that. n squared is any square number. The next square number will be x plus 1 squared. So just take any two squared numbers and compare them and think think back to this and just double check you understand where they've come from. Because really from then onwards it's pretty straightforward. So the difference between these two, well clearly it's the biggest one, take away the smallest one. Uh, n plus 1 all squared is n plus 1 times n plus 1, which is n squared plus 2n plus 1. Uh, next line of workings, n squared take away n squared is nothing, so we're just left with 2n plus 1. Now anything doubled is always even. So 2n plus 1 is always going to be odd. Therefore, the difference between two consecutive square numbers is always going to be odd.
Question 18 is on histograms. Now remember, the key thing with histograms is the area of each bar. So base times height is the frequency. So in this case, the number of customers. So for example, the number of customers who spent between uh, 0 and 10 minutes, we do base of 10 times height of 0 0.7 to give us 7 customers. Then again, those spending between 10 and 15 minutes, I've done base of 5 times height of 3.4 to give me 17 customers and so on. So in blue there, I've just done a whole series of base times height to work out that there's a total number of customers of 120. Now we're being asked to work out the proportion of these customers who spent between 17 and 35 minutes. So there's 17 marked in red, 17, and there's 35. So what I've done here is then to work out the area between these two red lines, that solid line there and that dotted line there. So working out the area here, I've got a base of 7. Um, I'm going from 17 up to 24. A base of 7, a height of 1. 7 ones are 7. Then that 15 is, of course, unchanged. And then over here, I've got a base of uh, uh, 5, going from 30 to 35. A height of 4.8, giving me an area of 12. So my re the um, the customers who've spent between 17 and 35 minutes are these numbers in red, the 7, the 15, and the 24. So adding that together, I've got 46 of the 120 customers who spent between 17 and 35 minutes. That's fine as a final answer, but you could have simplified it, simplified it if you wished. Now, for part B... We're being asked to find the probability the customer spent more than 36 minutes given they spent more than 30 minutes. Given they spent more than 30 minutes. So how many spent more than 30 minutes? So our 30 is here. Well, that's obviously the 72 that we've worked out already. Now, how many spent more than 36 minutes? So if I go from 36 here in black, I've got a base of uh, 9, going from 36 to 45, a height of 4.8, 4.8 times 9 is 43.2. So the proportion who spent more than 36 out of those who spent 30 is 43.2 out of the 72. So 43.2 over 72, which simplifies to 3 fifths. So just going over that again, it's the probability, so the numerator, is those who spent more than 36 minutes. The denominator is those who spent more than 30 minutes because we're trying to find out how many of those who spent more than 30 actually spent more than 36. I hope that makes sense. Question 19, part 8. So I'm just going to re rewrite that in the usual format, putting the x term first. So y equals minus 4x plus 7. Now remember, the coefficient of x, uh, the minus 4, that's the gradient, that's the slope, that's m. And then um, the number on the end, c, that's my y-intercept, the plus 7. So y equals mx plus c. So, all, so if we're going to have a parallel line, we just need to have the same gradient. So our answer has got to be y equals minus 4x and then any number following it apart from 7. So, for example, minus 4x plus 1. But you could have done minus 4x plus 2 or what have you. Now, for part B, let's start off by trying to work out the gradient of the line L. Now, I think the easiest way to do this is always just to do a quick sketch to help you gather your thoughts. So, minus 3 minus 1. Uh, sorry, minus 3 plus 1 up here. And 2 minus 2 over down here. So, just popping in my little triangle here, my x values are going from minus 3 to 2, so a length of 5. And my y values are going from minus 2 to plus 1, so a length of 3. So remember, the gradient is y step over x step, the height of the triangle divided by the base of the triangle, 3 over 5. But because the line is going downwards, left to right, it is a negative gradient, so minus 3 over 5. Now that's the gradient of L. We're being asked to find the equation of a line which is perpendicular to L. So to work out the gradient of this line that's perpendicular, you take the gradient of L and you flip it over. So no longer 3 over 5, but 5 over 3. And you change the sign. So no longer negative, but positive. So the gradient of my new line is 5 over 3. 
Now, I think to work out an equation of a line where um, you've just been given some random point, it's very useful to use the formula y minus y1 equals mx minus x1, where x1, y1 is any point on the line. Now, I, we've been given the point minus 6, 4. So y minus y1, so that's y minus 4, equals m, my gradient, 5 over 3, x minus x1 with my x1 is minus 6 so I'm minusing minus 6 so line 2 I've just tidied up this double minus minusing a minus 6 is plus 6 now I'm now for line 3 I've noted that my final answer requires all the number a b and c to be integers whole numbers so I'm going to take this opportunity as I go from line 2 to line 3 to get rid of this dividing by 3 so I'm multiplying both sides by 3. So y minus 4 becomes 3y minus 12. And on the right-hand side, I've undone this dividing by 3, so I'm just left with the 5. Line 4, I'm just expanding the bracket on my right-hand side. 5 times x, 5 times 6. And then finally, the final line, I'm just taking it all over to the right-hand side, setting it equal to 0. So 5x minus 3y plus 42 equals 0. That 42 coming from adding 12 to both sides, 30 of 12 is 42. Question 20. So a quick sketch to help me think what to do. So as a rectangle, area is 18, length is root 7 plus 1, and I'm being asked to work out the width. So we know base times height is area, so going the other direction, uh, um, the width is going to be area divided by um, yeah the, the the width is going to be the area divided by the base right base times height equals area so um, height equals area divided by base so 18 divided by root 7 plus 1 now I've got I need to get it into this format so I need to rationalize this third I've got to move away from having uh, this uh, any square roots in the denominator so the key learning point here is how do you rationalize a root 7 plus 1 you choose to multiply top and bottom by root 7 minus 1 you change the sign of the denominator and I'll show you why in a minute so that bit in red is the key step so the claw on top 18 times root 7 18 root 7 18 times minus 1 minus 18 now on the bottom I've got a pair of brackets so I'm going to so they're going to be the four claws so root 7 times root 7 is root 49 which is 7 root 7 times minus 1 is minus root 7 plus 1 times root 7 is plus root 7 and 1 times minus 1 is minus 1 now because we've done this change of sign over here we've gone from the plus to the minus these two middle terms the two terms including thirds will be equal and opposite so they can cancel out just leaving you with whole numbers on the bottom and obviously 7 take away 1 is 6 now we can then divide each term in in turn by the 6 18 divided by 6 is 3 so 18 root 7 divided by 6 is 3 root 7 and minus 18 divided by 6 is minus 3 question 21a so if you've got a transformation where you, it's inside the bracket so x plus 4 so, so the change the plus 4 is inside the bracket this affects the x coordinate opposite to what you'd expect so you're going to subtract 4 from the x coordinate the x coordinate is the 4 so subtracting 4 from that we get 0 6 now similarly this is also inside the function so affecting the x coordinate and again doing opposite to what you'd expect so rather than timesing it by 2 you're going to be dividing it by 2 or in other words timesing it by a half so take the x coordinate and halve it half of 4 is 2 so 2 6 so on each occasion the x coordinate was affected the y coordinate remained unchanged now for part b b is tricky if you don't think to actually choose to complete the square if we can change this format of the curve into a completing the square format it's quite easy then to think about the transformation so let's just start off by completing the square so remember in step one you've got to halve the coefficient of x so we're halving the three that's why i've got x plus three over two inside a bracket all being squared 
Step two, you then need to consider x plus 3 over 2 times x plus 3 over 2. And you don't want that fourth claw. You don't want the 3 over 2 times 3 over 2. 3 over 2 times 3 over 2 is 9 over 4. So we're backing out that minus 9 over 4. And then we've still got our 4 at the end. And because I know in a minute I'm just about to be adding these fractions, I'm rewriting the 4 as 16 over 4. Then gathering up my like terms here, I've got minus 9 over 4 and 16 over 4, which is 7 over 4. So that's me having completed the square, so rewriting the curve in an alternative format. Now it's easy for me to do the transformation. Uh, for my x, I need my x coordinate to move 4 to the right. So this goes inside the bracket and does the opposite to going 4 to the right, so it's minus 4. Okay, so the minus 4 inside the bracket represents a plus 4 transformation of the x-coordinates. Now the y-coordinate goes outside the bracket and does it exactly as it says on the tin. So the, the plus 6 for the y-coordinate is going to go on the outside of the bracket here. So then tidying this up, 3 over 2 take away 4 is minus 5 over 2. And 7 over 4 is 6 is 31 over 4. So that is our curve S, and we've been told there's no need to simplify the equation, so just leave it like that. Question 22. So the curve and the line intersect where they equal each other. So um, I can replace my uh, X inside the curve. Uh, no, sorry, I can replace my Y inside the curve. So both here and here. I can replace the y with what it is equal to, which is x plus 2. So this is the key line of workings, okay? I've rewritten the curve, replacing y with x plus 2. And as you can see now, my only unknown is x. So I just have to solve this to find out x. Once I know x, I can substitute it back in here. I can add 2 to it to work out the y values. So let's just process this. x plus 2 all squared is x plus 2 times x plus 2 which is x squared plus 4x plus 4. Minus 2 times x is minus 2x, and minus 2 times 2 is minus 4. Simplify the left-hand side and take away 24 from both sides. So forming a quadratic, I get this. And then I've noted that it's all even, so I'm just going to choose to divide by 2. And this factorizes what two magic numbers multiply to be minus 12, but add to be the coefficient of x, which is 1. Well, that's minus 3 and 4. So x minus 3, x plus 4. So my roots are plus 3 and minus 4. Remember, the roots are the values that in turn make each of these brackets equal to 0. So I've got my x coordinates, 3 and minus 4. And then my y coordinates, well, they're just two more than the x coordinates. So adding 2 to each of these, I get 5 and minus 2. So final answer, 3, 5, minus 4, minus 2. Question 23. So what do I know? I've been told that a to p is this vector, and I know that uh, uh, the midpoint of bc is m, so I'm going to call that 1 and that 1 because they're equal distances. Now I've been asked to work out the ratio of a to p to p to m, so in order to do this I'm going to need to work out what a to m is, and that's what I'm doing down here, and I'm going to choose to go via b. So going A to M, I'm going to go A to B and B to M. A to B to B to M. And, but I know that BM is half of BC, okay, because it's the midpoint. B to M is half of, of BC. So I'm replacing the BM with half of B to C. Now over on the left, as a working, I'm working out what B to C is. B to C, I can go via A. I can go B to A and A to C which is minus 4a, because I'm going down that the wrong way, and then plus 2b. So I've replaced my a to b with 4a, and I'm replacing my bc with my minus 4a plus 2b. So note how I've gone from one terminology to the other. I've gone from the capital letters to, with arrows here 
to lowercase a's and b's here. Don't, don't mix and match. Make sure you go across at the same time. I then just basically follow algebra here. So half of minus 4a, half of 2b is minus 2a plus b. So, and then gathering up my like terms of a, I get 2a plus b. So going from a to m is 2a plus b. So let's go and think about going from a to p to a to m and comparing the two vectors. a to p we were given, it was 3 over 2, 2a plus 3 quarters b, and uh, a to m we've just worked out to be 2a plus b. Now this is a third bigger, okay? This is going, going from here to here, the ratio is 3 to 4. 3 quarters to a whole, effectively 3 quarters to 4 quarters, 3 to 4. Similarly, 3 over 2 to 2 is in the ratio of 3 to 4. So what we're saying is the ratio of AP to AM is 3 to 4. Okay, 3 and then 4 all the way. So the PM bit must be the ratio of 1. It's a ratio of 3 to 1 which overall would be 3 to 4. So our final answer, the ratio of AP to PM is 3 to 1. Question 24. So a lot of algebra going on here. So first thing I've done is how do you divide by a fraction? Well, you can inverse this and change it into a multiple. So my first line of workings, I've kept this big bracket the same. I've changed it to a times in question, and I've just flipped over the second fraction. I've inversed this, so I've now got the 6x squared minus 12x plus 5 on top, and the 9x minus 4x cubed on the bottom. So that's step one. Now, working number one, I'm going to be, I'm subtracting these fractions here. So I'm, I'm working out inside this bracket, and I've done this over here. I need a common denominator, so I've chosen with this first fraction to multiply top and bottom by 2x minus 3, and the second fraction I'm choosing to multiply top and bottom by 2x minus 5. That gives me this common denominator. So just processing this, I do 4 times the 2x, 4 times the minus 3. And then careful here, this is minus 3 times the 2x, giving me minus 6x, and minus 3 times minus 5, which is plus 15. Tidying up, simplifying the numerator, I then get 2x minus 3 as the numerator, and on the bottom, 2x minus 5, 2x minus 3. And then those two brackets cancel out, leaving me with 1 over 2x minus 5. 1 over 2x minus 5. So that's all here. So that's working 1, starting here, finishing here. Now, secondly, I'm just factorizing the denominator over here, 9x minus 4x cubed. Over here is working number 2. So I can take out the x, first of all giving me x, 9 minus 4x squared. And then you've got to recognize that this is a difference between two squares. You've got a square, then subtracting a square. So you can factorize this bracket into 3 plus 2x, 3 minus 2x. So I'm starting off with my 9x minus 4x cubed, and I'm finishing with x, 3x plus 2, 3 minus 2x. And then my third working is um, factorizing the 6x squared minus 12x plus, I'm sorry, minus 17x plus 5, which I've just done down here in purple. So what two magic numbers multiply to be 6 times 5, which is 30, yet at the same time add to be the minus 17? as minus 2 and minus 15. So you rewrite this three-term um, expression as four terms. You rewrite the minus 17x as minus 15x and minus 2x. doesn't matter which way around. You then fully factorize terms 1 and 2, giving me this. And then you fully factorize terms 3 and 4, giving me this. And note how I've just fiddled around with the sign here to make sure the bracket is repeated. Then my final answer is the first bracket is the 3x and the minus 1. And my second bracket is the repeated bracket, the 2x minus 5. So that's how I've gone from 6x squared minus 17x plus 5 to um, 3x minus 1, 2x minus 5. Now at this point, my 2x minus 5 over here cancels with this 2x minus 5 over here, leaving me with this and all of this. So my final answer over here is 3x minus 1 all over x, 3x plus 2x, 3 minus 2x. This is the final answer here in black. Question 25. So we're adding on 
a set amount each year. So it's an arithmetic sequence. And we're being told the total he saves over a number of years is this. So it's actually going to be an arithmetic series. We're going to be adding up the amounts from each year. So again, you really need to be... The, the difficult bit here is gathering your thoughts to start with. So in 2021, he saves $50. Then each year, he's going to increase it by K dollars. So in 2022, he will save 50 plus K. The year after that, 2023, he'll save 50 plus 2K and so on. And we're told he saves all the way up to and including, including 2070. So first things first, we really need to establish how many years this is. So this is when N is 1, year 1, year 2, year 3. And we can see there's a 20-year difference between the, the end of the year and N. So in 2070, N, the number of years is 50. Now, A represents the, the first term, so that's clearly 50, so A is 50, and K, uh, D is the common difference. This is the amount it's going up by each year, so in this case, this is going to be called K, so D is K, and we know over these 50 years in total, uh, Mario is going to save 33,125, so the sum to 50 uh, the sum to n is 33,125. So just popping all of this into this, this given equation from the front of the, the uh, exam, and it's in the formula that are given, we get this, and it's then just processing the algebra. From then onwards, it's pretty straightforward for a difficult question. Okay, so we've got our sum to n, 33,125. Our n is 50. Our a is also 50. n minus 1, 50 minus 1 is going to be 49, and our d is k. So just processing the algebra through here, okay, two lots of 50 is 100, obviously 50 take away 1 is 49, expand the brackets, no, in fact I didn't, what I decided to do instead, at this point I divided by 25, okay, divided by 25, and then took, uh, took away the 100, divided by 49, and I get K being 25. Question 26. So there's a lot to do here. This is tricky. Now, the first thing I can do is work out the radius of this cone. That formula is given in the, the formulas at the front of the paper. So uh, the, vo the volume of a cone is a third pi r squared h. And I'm told the volume is 1,600. Uh, h is the height straight up, the vertical height, which is 25. So substituting that in here and rearranging and solving, I can work out the radius of the cone is 7.8176. So that's step one. Now, I'm now able to work out the length L, this diagonal length, okay, by using Pythagoras, okay? I've got a right ang angle triangle here where L is my length from O to B, the vertical height of this right angle triangle is 25, and the horizontal height at the bottom is the radius, the 7.8176 I've just worked out. So just using Pythagoras, I can work out that L is 26.1938. Okay, so I've popped that up here. That now becomes, that OB now becomes that radius of the whole circle. Right, thirdly, I can now work out this area up here, okay, of this sector. The sector can form this curved surface area of a cone. Now, the curved surface area of a cone is worked out by doing pi r l, okay? And I know uh, r is, um, uh, so the radius is the 7.8176, and I've just worked out that l to be 26.198. So I can work out that the area of this sector, which is also the area of the curved surface of the cone, to be 643.312. All right, radius 7.8176 and L the 26.1938. So that's all the bit here in red. So I've worked out that this area here is 643. Now, what about the area of the whole circle just using pi r squared? Well, my radius is 26.1938. So down here in purple, I've worked out the area, had it been a whole circle, to be 2155. Now, if the area of my sector is this and the area of the whole circle is this, the proportion 1 divided by 2 gives me the proportion of the whole circle that is the sector. 
Now, if I then multiply that by 360 degrees, obviously the degree is about a point, that will tell me how many degrees this sector has at the middle, in other words, x. So x is, is my 643 divided by my 2155 multiplied by 360, which is 107 degrees to the nearest whole number.